Uh, we do trust that the Lord will help us and bless us as again we consider his word together. And we're just going to read two verses tonight, please, and they're found in the Epistle to the Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, and we're going to read in chapter 12. So Romans and chapter 12. Now for any who haven't been here, and for those who have, let me just remind you that our subject and our theme over these uh, few evenings has been the subject of worship. And on Saturday night at the conference, we were thinking of the pillars and the principles of worship. And we were in Genesis 18, John 4, and we turned to, to Malachi chapter 1 just to see a deficiency there in worship. But then yesterday afternoon, Lord's Day afternoon and tonight, I want to think not of the pillars and the principles, but the presentation of worship. And yesterday afternoon, it was Mary and her alabaster box. Well, tonight it's a living sacrifice. And this, of course, is something that should be characteristic of every single believer. So the presentation of worship, Mary's alabaster box, and tonight a living sacrifice. So let's read these two verses together, shall we, in Romans 12. We know them so very, very well. And we are going to wander through them just bit by bit tonight. Tremendously challenging statements. Paul says this, Romans 12 and verse 1. Now, this is the opening statement, obviously, of the chapter. But I'm not going to come to this statement until the end of the meeting. Doesn't that sound strange? But there's good reason for it. Paul says, and this is the motivation. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren by the mercies, through the tender mercies or compassion of God. So that first statement is the motivation for what Paul is about to say. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by and through the tender mercies of God. Now this next statement, the end of verse one, is presentation. So from motivation to presentation, he says, I beseech you that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritually intelligent. The Greek word actually is the word logical, which is your spiritually logical service. And the word service there you don't find very often in the New Testament at all, but it has the idea really of religious or worshipful service. So this is one of the great acts of worship in the New Testament, isn't it? And it's an expectation for every believer. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worshipful service. So you have motivation at the start of the verse, then you have presentation, and then in verse 2, transformation. Paul says, and, and really this is by way of explanation, and, or that is, be not conformed to this world. The word there is age, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now that's our reading tonight and as always we look to the Lord and we especially need that this evening for the blessing upon his word. So tonight we're thinking about the presentation of worship, not Mary's alabaster box, but we are thinking about every believer's living sacrifice. Now, I would call this section, once it is that you get to Romans 12, and it runs all the way through to chapter 15, almost really into chapter 16, I would call these few chapters the duty, the duty of the justified. Now, that's a key theme, isn't it, in the Roman epistle. Paul has been constantly speaking of 
this great theme of being justified by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he has been emphasizing the truth of justification and how it is that God can righteously forgive sinners and thank God through faith and by grace. You and I are justified. Every believer is justified. What a glorious word it is. A legal term. We have been cleared of every charge in the sight of a holy God. We have been acquitted of guilt and we have been declared righteous in the sight of this holy God. Now, that really has been the theme of the epistle to the Romans. So now that we are justified and we are on that ground, Paul is going to be at pains to teach us and to tell us that this salvation, this justification, it utterly transforms the life. Doesn't it? We're not the same anymore. We're different. And so that genuine faith in the Lord Jesus must be in evidence by the way that we live our lives. And that begins in chapter 12 and runs all the way through to the end of the epistle. So that's why I call those chapters very practical chapters. That's why I call them the duty of the justified ones. Now, let me just show you one or two of these things. We're only thinking about verses one and two tonight in particular. But as you come to verse three of chapter 12, and it runs down to verse eight, Paul says, well, one of the duties of those who are justified is the duty of contribution. Look at what he says in verse three. He speaks about the fact that to every individual has been given a measure of faith. He is speaking about spiritual gift. He says in verse four, as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ. Verse six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us. So Paul says one of the first duties of those that are justified is the duty of contribution contribution to the society of the people of God and contribution to the local assembly to which you belong because we are members in a body and although my body could function without a hand and my body could function without a foot it wouldn't function the way it should and the way it could without those members. So Paul is saying, now come on, this is your responsibility to contribute to the local assembly, the exercise of spiritual gift. And I trust that I am talking to believers in the Lord Jesus tonight who are certain what their spiritual gift is and that you are exercising that spiritual gift for the good of the people of God. So there's the duty of contribution. And then Paul, when he comes to verse 9, and really this theme runs all the way down to the end of chapter 12, he says, you also have a duty of affection, love one to the other. That's obvious in verse 9, isn't it? Let love be without dissimulation. And the verses that flow out of that statement they are teaching us that as believers, as justified ones, we should have mutual love, one for the other, for every other believer. And it should be a love that is genuine, a love that is without hypocrisy, that we should be ministering to and in harmony with one another. So the duty of contribution the duty of affection. Now, just two others. When you come into the start of chapter 13, and I suppose this is particularly relevant for the day and age in which we are living, but the first 10 verses of Romans 13, well, that's the duty of 
subjection. Look at what he says in verse one. He says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. So Paul is speaking about the governing authorities in our lands, in our world. And those governing authorities have been appointed by God for our social well-being and welfare. And Paul says it is a responsibility of those who are justified, a responsibility to be subject to those governing authorities. And dare I say it, dare I say it, even in the matter of vaccinations, which essentially, well, there you are, I've said it, which essentially is coming under the recourse of the governing authority of the land. Oh, and paying your taxes, but that's besides the point, maybe. Now, look at the end of chapter 13. The duty of contribution, the duty of affection, the duty of subjection. And the last few verses of chapter 13, we'll leave it here. It's just an introduction. The duty of separation. Interesting that he says in verse 11, knowing the time. He says it's high time to awake out of sleep. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. So cast off the works of darkness. The duty of separation. We should live as those that belong to the day. We should be marked by morality in the way that we live having put off the works of darkness, living lives that are separate morally from those who are round about us. So various duties that belong to the justified ones. Now, why does Paul begin in chapter 12 as he does? He's not now speaking about this duty of contribution, affection, subjection, separation, all that will come. But he says, before all that, he says, I want to talk to you about the duty of presentation. And I want to talk to you about the duty of transformation. And he says, listen, at the end of the day, he says, I'm asking a great deal of you to present your bodies, a living sacrifice upon the altar. That every justified one, every believer should be a burnt offering, a living burnt offering upon the altar. And you should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are thinking in a wholly different way. You are living in a completely different way to the way that you used to. Now you live according to the word of God and the will of God. Paul says, I know I'm asking a great deal, but it should be characteristic of every believer. And he begins by giving us a motivation to live like that. Now, I am going to come back to the motivation because it's so important. And so we're going to begin in the second part of verse one. We're going to try and understand this duty of presentation. So look at the second part of verse one. He says, I beseech you that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable or well-pleasing unto God, which is your intelligent and worshipful serve. First of all, then, present. Present your bodies. Remember on Saturday, we spoke about Abraham as he had prepared for the Lord the quantity and the quality of those things that he did in order that he might minister to his divine visitor. And then he stood by them under the tree. And Abraham essentially was presenting himself. Now, Paul is saying that's the expectation of the justified one. He says, present your body. That word is translated elsewhere in Romans, yield. Yield your body to God. The word literally means 
place beside God. That's beautiful, isn't it? Put yourselves at his disposal. And at least in the secular Greek, this word present or yield was used of the tool in the hand of the carpenter. It was used to describe the weapon in the hand of the soldier. I tell you, that's wonderful. And just as the tool in the hand of the carpenter, that tool would do exactly as the carpenter desired and it would produce something beautiful and tangible. And so the weapon in the hand of the soldier, it moved at his behest. Paul says that's exactly the point. You present yourselves. He says you place yourself beside and at the disposal of the mighty God. So this is something that is complete. Present your bodies something that's absolute, something that is characteristic and total, he says, present. Now, what do we present? Well, we present our bodies. Now, of course, Paul here is speaking of the body as representative of the whole person. He says, present yourself, your whole person. Don't leave anything out now. Not the faculty of your mind and intelligence, not your heart and your affection. He says the whole person must be placed upon the altar. Interesting how Paul speaks about the body in the epistle to the Romans. You see, and it really is set in real contrast to Romans 12. But when you go back to Romans chapter 1, the heathen. Paul speaks about the bodies of the heathen. And sadly, those heathen, those immoral individuals, they dishonoured their body. And while Paul speaks of Romans 3, in Romans 3, he speaks about various aspects of the body. He speaks about the throat and the tongue and the mouth and the feet. And he says there was a time when we actually use the members of our body in the service of sin. But now he says everything's altogether different. We're not using our bodies now for dishonourable purposes. We're not using our bodies now in the service of sin. No, no. He says now, presenting your bodies, presenting yourselves as a holy, and a living sacrifice unto God. Now, I hope you're still with me. This is going to take a little bit of concentration. This is a little bit expositional, I understand that. But let me tell you this, we're going to reach a crescendo. But you have to stay with me. Now, listen to what Paul says about the presentation of this body. He says, it is a living sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. Now, with the thought of the whole person upon the altar, our minds cannot help but, and I'm sure Paul was thinking of this too, our minds cannot help but go to Leviticus 1. And you're thinking of the burnt offering. You're thinking of the animal that was placed in its totality, all of it placed upon the altar for the pleasure of God. The head was there. That's the intelligence. The fat was there. That's all the energy of the animal. The inwards was there. Think about the affection. The legs were there. Think about the service and the activity. All of the animal upon the altar. But here's the difference. That animal was dead. Living when it came to the altar. Dead. When it was on the altar. Paul says, no, no. He says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see, the animal sacrifice was living, then it was dead. The believer's sacrifice, well, we were once dead, but now we live. Dead in trespasses and sins, sure. 
died with Christ. Yes. But now we walk in newness of life. Paul says this sacrifice is living. Paul says this sacrifice, now listen, this sacrifice must be holy. It is only as our bodies, ourselves, are held in holiness that that sacrifice will be acceptable. You remember the sacrifices of old? You remember how that they were to be without spot, without blemish. In fact, although Peter speaks about a lamb as of a lamb without spot and without blemish, you'll find that actually there's only one sacrificial animal in the Old Testament that is described as being without spot and without blemish. Now, that's the red heifer. But when you're thinking about without spot, that's internal. Without blemish, that's external. And when Paul here, clearly with a burnt offering, and clearly with almost the contrast as well as the comparison of an animal sacrifice, when Paul has that in mind, I can't help in relation to the holiness of the sacrifice and the spot and the blemish think about positional and practical holiness and sanctification. So what's Paul saying? He's saying, unless, now this is what the entirety of the epistle, more or less, has been about so far. He's saying, unless there is positional holiness. Now, thank God. The moment that you and I were saved, then by the grace of God, we were sanctified in a positional sense. We were declared righteous, holy in the sight of God. So as far as the inward spot is concerned, we are holy. But there's something else here. You see, we are to live out in practice what God has made us in terms of our position. And so we don't just speak about positional sanctification. We speak about progressive or practical sanctification, living a life without blemish outwardly and by our actions that declare what God has made us inwardly by position. Now, I think Paul has it all in mind. He says, I beseech you, brethren, present yourselves a living sacrifice. He says it must be hope. My brother, my sister, listen. There could just be some on the call tonight who have unconfessed sin in their lives, living lives of sin, and you have a conscience about it, and the word of God has revealed it to you. My brother, my sister, you cannot live a life of worshipful service unless that sin has been confessed and put right in the sight of God. That's practical sanctification. It's the great three theme of 1 John 1. If we confess our sin, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's living. It's holy, says Paul, then it will be acceptable. He says, if this is the case, it will be well-pleasing. This really is the divine response to such a sacrifice. It therefore ascends as a sweet savour, that which is well-pleasing unto God. Now, at the end of verse one, and we're still thinking about presentation, he says, quite frankly, this is your reasonable service. Now, there's two Greek words there, but the word that's translated reasonable in Greek is literally the word logical. So Paul says, now, 
This is your logical service. This is your response of spiritual intelligence to all that God has done. Surely you would be willing to offer your life in worshipful service to him. I tell you, what a contrast to those animals. You see, those animal sacrifices had absolutely no appreciation and no consciousness at all of why it was that they were being brought to the altar. But you and I, we have made a rational choice. We have made a spiritually intelligent choice. This is therefore a deliberate act of spiritual worship and spiritual service unto God. One commentator puts it like this. Since God has been so merciful, failure to dedicate one's life to him is the height of folly and the height of irrationality. Now, maybe I need to say that again. Since God has been so merciful, we're coming to it. Failure to dedicate one's life to him is the height of folly and the height of irrationality. So the duty of presentation. Now, Paul goes on to develop that in verse two. So now we have what I'm calling the duty of transformation. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The duty of transformation. Now, that little word and is really a word of explanation, not addition. So Paul is saying, present your bodies a living sacrifice. That is. The thought is, this is the means by which the presentation of verse one is effected and accomplished. That is, be not conformed to this world. Well, you all know what J.B. Phillips says about that. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mould. Be not conformed. Do not become behaviorally similar. Do not become molded to the pattern of the spirit of this age. Now, Paul, of course, is speaking morally. You and I morally should not be behaviorally similar to the morality of this age. My brother, my sister, you know this, Galatians 1. You know that this present age is evil. You know, don't you, that the spirit of this age and the humanity that belongs to this evil age, they dance to the beat of the God of this age. But you and I are different. An age that encourages human beings to live lives that are utterly independent of God. We live our lives in dependence upon him. And what about the spirit of this age? Well, it's a spirit of self-indulgence, isn't it? It's a spirit of self-satisfaction. This world has a spirit of pleasure-seeking. This world has a spirit of self-ambition. This world has a spirit of materialism. And all of it comes out of, not God. It comes out of the world. And indeed, ultimately, the God of this world. The devil himself. Paul says, do not become molded to the pattern of the spirit of this age, but rather, he says, 
be transformed. What a word. The word here in the Greek is metamorphosis. Be utterly transformed. Just as the larvae would turn ultimately into a butterfly. He says, as a believer in the Lord Jesus, you should be utterly transformed. Metamorphosis should have taken place in your life. When you think what we were saved from, and you think what kind of service we were saved from, you think what God has made us and given us. He says there is utter transformation here. And just as an animal that metamorphoses, if that's even a word, just as it changes its form and it changes its habits and it changes its nutrition even, so you and I should find that the same is happening in our lives. Now, let me tell you something to give you a little encouragement. The word here, be transformed, is passive in the Greek meaning the responsibility for that transformation lies with someone or something else thank god for that it takes a lifetime doesn't it this transformation it's passive you say who or what then is doing the transforming well paul will tell you elsewhere and he's been speaking about it in romans 8 can only be the power and the person of the spirit of god 2 Corinthians 3 puts it like this. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. A transformation. And... To make it even more specific, he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, again, Paul has had one or two things to say about the mind in the epistle to the Romans. And he's spoken about it as those of us who had a reprobate mind. When we were outside of Christ, before we were saved, we had a mind that was absolutely incapable of discerning what was morally right and morally wrong. We could not discern or ascertain the mind and the will of God. We had reprobate minds. But now he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it's the spirit of God that has given us a new nature. We have been regenerated. We have been born from above. And as a result, we think in an entirely different way. We now have a thinking that is adjusted, not by Facebook, neither the media of this world, neither the society in which we live. Our thinking isn't adjusted by that. We have a thinking that is adjusted by the word of God. And we think therefore according to the will of God. And look at the way that the end of the verse closes. He says, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may proof the will of God. Now the word prove there is really the idea of commending something. So as you and I, as you and I have adjusted our thinking to the word of God and the will of God, we will be obedient to it. And in being obedient to it, we commend it. We prove the word of God. And what do we prove it to be? We prove it to be good. We prove it to be beneficial to us. It is, isn't it? 
Sometimes you wouldn't believe it, and sometimes we don't want to obey it. But we're sure of this. The obedience to the word of God in our lives is beneficial to us. Says Paul, you commend, you commend the will of God by showing it to be good, beneficial manward. Oh, and it is acceptable. That is by being obedient to the word of God, you will be pleasing to him. So it's beneficial to us. It's pleasing to him. And he says it's perfect. Morally perfect altogether different to the way that this world lives well there you are what do you think about that we could finish now 15 minutes early you say that is the duty of presentation that is the duty of transformation now how are you doing what an act of worship it is to devote one's life and living to God himself, to just place ourselves at his disposal, to be used of him as he will, to transform the way that we think through the power of the Spirit of God, by being led and obedient to the word of God. This is a lifetime act of worship. Now, how are you doing? I want to close by saying this. Now, some of you will take a large gulp at this point. Because it's going to take us from Romans 1 to Romans 11. But Paul says, I, I know this is a great thing. He says, I know this demands your life. But he says, listen, I want to give you some motivation some motivation now that takes me back to the beginning of verse one now some of you know where i'm going with it says paul i'm going to make an appeal to your heart to your heart i'm going to make an appeal to your will he says i beseech you brethren that's interesting, isn't it? He doesn't command them. There is no imperative here. He says, I beseech you. It's a very tender word. It's almost as if he is calling every believer that he's writing to. It's almost as if he is calling them alongside him. He says, I want to tenderly exhort you. He's not commanding them to total devotion to Christ. But he's saying, I want to just tenderly exhort you. Because essentially, Paul knows he can't command them to totally devote themselves to Christ. There's no way that every single believer could obey a command like this. And so he says, I want to appeal to your heart. It's almost as if he's saying, I want this to be your heart's desire, your heart's yearning. I want your heart and affection to recognise that this is the only reasonable course of action. When we consider all that Christ, all that God has done, in the person of his son so he says i beseech you now here's the key word you ready for this folks you young folks listen here's the key word in all of those two verses i beseech you therefore brethren and whenever paul uses the word therefore or wherefore what's he doing He's taking you back. Now, I believe with all my heart. Paul is saying, I beseech you. 
on the basis of Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Remove the brackets if you've got them in your mind. 9, 10 and 11. He says, I beseech you therefore, according to the tender mercies of God, present your bodies. Now what do I mean? Well let me just take you through one or two of these things and then I'm done. What about if you go back to Romans 3? You'll remember that Paul in Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, he's taken the whole of humanity and he's placed them into three categories. And when he comes down to the middle section of Romans chapter 3, he says, All the world guilty. That's what we were, brethren. All of sin. He says, All the world guilty. Guilt is proclaimed. It's a courtroom scene. The counsel for the prosecution is brought forth. And the counsel for the prosecution in Romans 3 is the word of God. Paul calls on the Old Testament scriptures and he says, there you are, guilty, 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 all of mankind. And then says Paul, in the interest of fairness, we will bring forth the counsel for the defense. And you and I, as part of the human race, we're in the dock, guilty as child, but give them some defense. And what's the defense in Romans 3? Every mouth is stopped. There isn't any defense. And so the verdict comes forth. All the world guilty. We're sinners in the sight of God. Lost. Without any hope. And then you just look at the bright shining light of Romans 3 and 22. Or well, you don't need to look at it. But Paul says this. All the world guilty. And then he says, but, but now. He says, but now, in the day and age in which we live, living as he did just some years after Christ and all that Christ had accomplished at Calvary, he says, but now, the righteousness of God, altogether apart from the works of the law, is manifested. That is, God has provided a righteous standing in his presence. God has provided salvation. God has provided redemption. The righteousness of God is manifested. And it was manifested there at Calvary. That God might be just and the justifier of them that believe in Jesus. Hallelujah salvation and redemption available in Christ. Now says Paul, I beseech you therefore, by the tender mercies of God, present your bodies. There's no other logical course of action. Come on. It was the gutter or else a living sacrifice upon the altar. Now that's Romans 3. And then again, you're running out of Romans 3 into Romans 4 and Romans 5. And here comes a little bit of theology. But if you don't grasp this, what I'm about to say in the next few minutes, you're only living half a Christian life. Now, when he runs through Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 5, the beginning of Romans 5, he says, Christ has made provision for our sins. Sins, plural. He says, Christ has made provision for what I have done. The fruit of sin in my life. And he has made provision by making propitiation. There on the cross. What a glorious word that is. That word propitiation takes in the thought of sacrifice. It takes in the thought of satisfaction, Godward, 
It takes in the thought of a sanctuary, manward, for all those who come into the good of propitiation. In Romans 3 and Romans 5, Paul's going to speak about the fact that Christ has effected redemption and he has brought us out of the slave market of sin. We've been delivered, those who were under sin and under the weight and burden of sin. We've been delivered by a ransom. And justification has been secured. Now, if you put it all together, salvation, justification, redemption, on the basis of propitiation, says Paul, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Think of all of that. He says, there is no intelligent, there is no other intelligent course of action than to live for Christ. Now, when you're in the second part of Romans 5, Romans 6, Romans 7, the beginning or the first half of Romans 8. Now it's not so much God's provision for our sins, what I've done. But now it is God's provision for sin. That is what I am. I tell you, we'd be a very sorry lot if Christ had only dealt with the fruit. If Christ had only dealt with what I've done. I tell you, that would be no good. Because the real problem's in here. The real problem is the root. The real problem is what I am by nature in Adam. The way that I was born, the root principle of sin, says Paul. Listen, Romans 5, 6, 7, 8. Christ was dealt not just to do, Christ was sent not just to deal with sins, Christ was sent to deal with sin. And at Calvary, now this is the opening of Romans 8, at Calvary, God condemned sin. That is God condemned sin in the flesh. He passed sentence upon what I am, the human race in Adam. And that sentence and that judgment was born in the flesh, in the body of Christ, which was given in death on the cross at Calvary. And so, listen, this is what I meant about living half the Christian life. If you're only in the good of Romans 3, 4 and 5, thank God my sins are forgiven. How can you live the Christian life? That's half a job. You need to be living in the light too of Romans 5b, 6, 7, 8. Thank God I, me, in Adam, finished, brought to an end before God in death. Romans 6 and 6, I am crucified with Christ. And I've been identified with him in his death. And I've died to sin, raised to walk in newness of life. You say, I don't feel like I'm dead to sin. Well, I know you might not feel like it, but the word of God says, believe it. It says, know the truth, reckon the truth, count it to be true. Yield yourself to God. We are dead to sin as a king. It has no right to reign and rule over me any longer. I am delivered. And as a result, I'm sanctified. Now, again, I think you need me to repeat these things. Salvation. Redemption. Justification. On the basis of propitiation. Now we have identification. Now we have sanctification. Paul says, I beseech you. Therefore, brethren. On the basis of all this, live for Christ. There's no other logical, no other logical choice, form of service.
Oh, you say, Brother Dan, you're finished. Well done. You've made it to 12th. You see, there's brackets around 9, 10 and 11 in my Bible. We'll just whip it out. That has to do with Israel. Don't you believe? Romans 9, 10 and 11. From the doctrine to the dispensation. Yes, it has to do with the nation. Here is a nation of Israel that has been sovereignly chosen and yet rebellious. Here is a nation that has rejected the gospel. Here is a nation that is under judicial discipline. And yet because of their unbelief, you and I as Gentiles have been brought into the place of favour and the place of opportunity by believing the gospel incredible you say have god's promises to the nation of israel failed not at all that nation is beloved for the father's sake the blindness of that nation is partial it's not permanent there is a day coming when all israel shall be saved and paul says brethren he says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. I tell you, now there is satisfaction. There is satisfaction in divine purpose. There is satisfaction in divine promise. There is absolute assurance in all that God is doing. And just to sum it up, if God is for us, brethren, who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. He foreknew us. He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. He called us. He justified us. In the purpose of God, he's already glorified us. Now, I won't go through all of those words again. But add to the justification and redemption, add to them glorification. And add to them satisfaction and assurance. And I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the tender compassion of God. See what he's done. I beseech you. Present your bodies. A living sacrifice. All upon the altar. Holy. Acceptable unto God. It is your logical. Intelligent. Act of worship. You've heard about Count Zinzendorf, or maybe you haven't. Count Zinzendorf believed that at the age of nine years old, he had committed his life to Christ. But there was a sense in which he had committed his life to Christ religiously. And he always sought to do what was right. Now, he lived in the 1700s. In fact, he was born in the year 1700. And he always sought to do what was right and to bring it into modern parlance. He was at all the meetings and he read his Bible and he thought he was living for Christ. And yet there's a very famous story of him. That at 19 years of age, 1719, he went into a great art gallery. And in the art gallery, he came face to face with a glorious painting. And the painting was called Ecce homo, which means behold the man. And it was a painting, it was a representation of Christ as he stood before Pilate. And with a crown of thorns upon his head. Behold the man, as Pilate said. And Count Zinzendorf looked at that picture. And in the hand of Christ, 
the artist had painted almost a placard or a block of wood that had these words on it. All this I did for thee. What have you done for me? Now that is Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, all this I've done for you. What have you done for me? When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. God will bless his word to us.